All right, class, we've got two new physics problems to learn today and then practice problems to give out to you. And then uh, six of you will be tutors and those tutors will do the usual, help students one-on-one -on -one and um, and learn physics even better for, them, for themselves. Because when you teach it, you actually have to really have, you need a deep understanding. All right. Let's look at our problem. The moon has nearly a circular orbit around the earth with a radius of 384,000 kilometers and a time of 27.3 days for a full rotation. What is the moon's centripetal acceleration? So yesterday we watched a video of uh, a cartoon character spinning a yo-yo with a string. And that string is the centripetal acceleration. It represents the centripetal acceleration because that yo-yo wants to launch into the air. But the string is strong enough to pull the yo-yo back down or back towards the middle. And so the moon does the same thing. The moon wants to fly free, launch into space and, and not be around Earth. But Earth has this centripetal acceleration that is constantly re-guiding the moon back. So that's what we're going to calculate today. How fast is that moon coming back at us? So you have to draw yourself a moon. Draw a circle. You can put a crater or two. And write the radius is 384,000 kilometers. Huge piece of, of um, debris in space the time it takes to rotate around earth is 27.3 days now yesterday i asked the waterfall question how do you reduce 1 billion into a number with less zeros and almost everyone used the exponent one raised to the ninth and that was correct we're going to use exponents to save the number of zeros you have to write because you can easily write an extra zero or forget a zero, and now your entire calculation is inaccurate. So we're gonna use something called scientific notation. And that requires you to look at a huge number, imagine it to be a small number and multiply it by an exponent. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going a little out of order. So it says second step but you can just write this on the side somewhere. The number 384,000 is a big number, but if we imagine it to be a small number and multiply it by an exponent, it's much easier to put in a calculator and to rewrite. So the small number I want you to imagine is 3.84 instead of 384,000. In order to make this number small, we have to move the decimal five times to the left. So decimals here in 384,000. But to make it 3.84, you move it five times. One, two, three, four, five. And that means we are going to multiply 3.84 by an exponent, 10 to the fifth. And that's the number we're going to use. Now, in your calculators, you can always put 3.84 and then hit multiply and then hit 10 and then hit caret, you know, for the exponent and then five. That's a lot of work. So let me show you how to do the, the quickest version of times 10 raised to the fifth in your calculator. Everyone grab a calculator. So grab a calculator right behind your screen. Type 3.84. And then click on second, and then click on x minus one. It's right above seven. So when you click x minus one, which is right above seven, you should see a letter E. Does everyone see letter E after your 3.84? That represents times 10. All you need to do now is push five, and 3.84 E5 is the same thing as 3.84 times 10 to the fifth. And you're going to use that to write your calculations and do your input in the calculator. 
All right, so that's the, the side list. How do you shrink huge numbers using exponents? Uh, how many have done scientific notation before? Raise your hand, anybody? Okay, so it's good you're learning now. There's an equation to find the centripetal acceleration, how fast the moon is being pulled back towards Earth. Question. Because we move the decimal five times. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, one at a time. Finish your question. Yes. We want to move the decimal so that this 3.84 becomes, this 384,000 becomes 3.8. Question. So if the number's already small, then you can change it to If the number's already small, you don't have to. Yeah, if it was already 3.84, you don't, like 300, if it was 300, you don't have to do that. Um, right now, our calculators are going to be stuck in a mode for this week where it always does times 10. So 300 is going to be 3 times 10 to the 2. It's going to be kind of annoying this week, but it's going to help us with the big numbers. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then that number of moves is the exponent. And I'm glad this is recorded so that you too can re uh, hear the explanation. All right. All right. So we're on uh, Schoology 02 centripetal acceleration. All right, Shauna? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to put this in your calculator, it's no longer 384,000, it's 3.84. And then you hit second and then X minus one, which is a button above seven. Your calculator should say E and that represents times 10. And you just put five. So 3.84 E five is the same thing as 3.84 times 10. And let me you can add that in the notes. So this is the same thing as 3.84 E5. And I'm going to go even more lazy and write a lowercase e. So much faster than a capital E. But these two are the same. In fact, these three are the same values. All right. Let's use our new triangle from yesterday to calculate how fast that moon is coming at us. So... AC is under V2 and next to R. If you want to find acceleration of centripetal force, you divide V2 by R. If you want to find V2, you multiply AC times R. And if you want to find R, it's V2 divided by AC. And a lot of you did that successfully in the warm-up yesterday. But we're not trying to find V2, and we're not trying to find R. We're trying to find AC. So let's rewrite that as AC equals V2 over R. And we look at our problem. Our problem says 384,000 kilometers. That's our R. And we have time, 27.3 days. There's no V, there's no velocity. So we have to do some extra work and find velocity. So let's do the third step. We have to first turn our kilometers into meters and then our days into seconds. And then we put it into our velocity equation. So write down R equals 3.84. And just to be consistent, I'm going to write E5 because we just learned it. E5. Now we're going to multiply it to a fraction so that we can reduce the units to uh, velocity units. That fraction is 1,000 over 1, representing 1,000 meters over kilometers. Kilometers will cancel out. We've done this since September. And you're left over with 
3.84E5 times 1,000. I'm going to choose a student to put this in the calculator and help us with a, uh, a is sum. No. What do you call when things multiply to each other? Sum is add, quotients divide, product. What's the product? So Natalie, grab a calculator. Uh, you should already have 3.84E5 in, the, in there. Just hit uh, times 1,000, and you should get the answer with X parts. What do you get? Ten to the eighth. Okay. So yesterday, period four, uh, switched the mode of all everyone's calculators so that the answers will always be times ten. So now you know what to write. So um, that's our that's our meters. We just found R as three point eight four times ten to the eighth. But the shorter way than that is E eight. So that's our R. We also need to find time because the velocity equation requires length and time. So let's do that. Fourth step, your time is in days. Velocity is in meters per second. So we're going to multiply that by a fraction. I don't expect you to memorize this. In one day, there's 86,400 seconds. Days will cancel out. And let's have a student calculate that for us. Elijah, you got a calculator? Grab, grab a calculator. Put in 27.3. Twenty seven point three times eighty six thousand four hundred. And then what's at the very, very end? Times ten to the sixth. And if we round ten point three six E six. E represents times ten. So it's good we discuss the scientific notation, otherwise the E would be very uh, confusing. Now we can take these two values, put it in our velocity equation, and put it into our acceleration equation. So we've got um, this velocity equation, v equals 2 pi r over t. Now the reason why this isn't uh, velocity equals x over t, like we've been doing on previous tests, is because we're trying to find the velocity of an object traveling in a circular motion. You got to learn how things travel in straight lines. If you're going to be an engineer or work in a uh, mechanical uh, environment or be a science teacher, you have to learn uh, how when things travel in a straight line, like kind of like rocket launching and landing, but also how objects can be pulled in a circular motion, like orbiting. And that is uh, a new velocity equation, V equals 2 pi R over T. But we know R and we know T. So it's just algebra. We plug in. It's going to be 2 pi parentheses 3.84 E8, right? Natalie found that for us. Uh, divided by 2, I'm missing a decimal there, 2.36 E6. Elijah found that one for us. Let's have a student do the math. Here, Caitlin, grab a calculator and give me two times pi. Pi is on the left side of your calculator. Two times pi times 3.84. You're going to push a second x minus 1. Eight. Want me to repeat it? Or do you got it? But it, doesn't it have exponents at that very end? Did you get exponents? Did, okay, so that so, so that one did not get 
uh, change here. Let's try this one. Okay. This one has. So you need S S I S D I at the bottom of the calculator. So um, that is actually correct, but, yeah. but there's an easier way to look at it. So so Caitlin's calculator wasn't in the exponent uh, mode, so she got a huge number that she would have to write on her paper. But instead, she's going to try two times pi times three point eight four e eight. What'd you get? Power of 10? Nine. Nine. Okay. All right. So that's our denominator. Write that down. And then we uh, just rewrite our... She found the numerator. We rewrite our denominator. And uh, Bradley, grab a calculator. And you're going to take Caitlin's value of 2.41 second x minus 1, 9 then click divide by 2.36 second x minus 1 6 the power 3 correct well done so we saved probably a page of notes by not having to write all these zeros here zeros there zeros here and zeros here and the zeros again, or maybe half a page, but still much easier to track, track your thinking. We're not done yet. Last step is to plug in our velocity into our acceleration equation. If you look at step one, it's AC equals velocity squared over R. We plug in, we take Bradley's value of velocity 1.02 times uh, 10 to the third squared divided by 3.84 E8. That was from our radius. So let's have this student do the math. Plot is, grab a calculator. And this can actually be done in one calculation. Hit 1.02 second X minus one, three, then click square right away. Then click divide. 3.84 second x minus 1, 8. Don't have to rewrite anything. What'd you get? And might put it, yeah, the, the two point seven one is correct, but then there's exponents at the end. So one point oh two second x minus one three squared divided by three point eight second three point eight four second x minus one e to the eighth. Yeah. Nine? Yeah. Got it? What kind of three? Negative three. So we've got this tiny number now representing how fast the moon is coming at us. It's not it's not 2,700 or 2,700. It's going to be 0. 0.0027. But that's that's not the focus here. The focus is you found how fast the moon is coming back at us even though it's trying to get away. It gets away a little bit, but then it gets redirected as, a, as, as our moon. And that's how you find centripetal acceleration. All right, let's do the next one. Yes. No, because the, the number can be like a million. Like there could be three more zeros. So then it'll move eight times. And then it's going to be 3.84 times 10 to the eight. Good question. I know there's some rules in physics where you have to do one thing all the time for every problem. But in this case, scientific notation is something 
you can use in math classes and science classes. And, and hopefully one day you have that much money that you can just use scientific notation in your uh, bank account. All right, that is our centripetal acceleration. This next problem is like two of the of what we just did. It's like a double, double, uh, a double whammy of physics problems. But, but I know you can do it. Okay, I know you can do it. That's why you're in this class. So go to zero three centripetal force. You're gonna need a brand new sheet of paper. I want you to take a deep breath, let it out. Click on zero three centripetal force. This physics problem gave me a, a big headache yesterday because my physics teacher did not explain it well. And so I had to go to multiple sources and uh, we're actually gonna watch a short YouTube video that explains what uh, part of this problem is about. Because it's centripetal acceleration is how fast something is moving towards you and it's going faster and faster. Centripetal force is how much energy you need for a specific mass that's coming at you, right? Acceleration doesn't include mass, but force does. So we're gonna watch a tiny, a short video and then do this problem where if you're driving in a car, how do you know if the car is gonna go off the road when you turn or is it gonna stay on the road? Okay, physics can help you determine that. But let's, let's watch a uh, very brief explanation on friction. So, Static friction, and this will be centripetal. Hello, centripetal force. Yeah, of course. All right, and the YouTuber's name is, I think it's Dave. So let me see if I can find it. There it is. Okay, so we're gonna watch this. It's Professor Dave. Let's learn about friction. In examining Newton's laws of motion, we have to understand that the kinds of motion we observe on Earth don't always appear to obey these laws because there are extraneous variables acting upon Earth-bound objects. And most of these involve some kind of frictional force. Friction is an important concept to understand, so let's go over it in some detail. Whenever an object is in motion along a surface, the surface exerts a force upon the object. One component of this force is the normal force, which is perpendicular to the surface. Okay, we learned that, normal force. New concept is frictional force. What will resist an applied force? Like a car that's trying to turn, friction will save that car from sliding off the road also a component of this force that is parallel to the surface. And this is called the frictional force or simply friction. This is the force that will resist the motion of the object along the surface. Every surface has some frictional coefficient that will vary depending on its composition. To see this demonstrated, try to push a small block across some ice and then try to push it across some sandpaper. These materials differ in their resistance to motion for reasons that relate to their composition. The smoother a surface is, the less friction it will provide. But even surfaces that appear perfectly smooth will have imperfections on the microscopic level that provide some friction. And our car tires are designed to have these microscopic imperfections, right? The grooves in the tire, the treads, especially all weather tires. There are so many treads that the car has a lot of friction in muddy and wet uh, pavements. And uh, that's what he's referring to. As the object moves across the surface, there are select points of contact where atoms in the object interact with atoms in the surface. And this attractive interaction hinders motion to some measurable degree, no matter how small. Let's define two main types of friction, static and kinetic. Static friction is the friction that resists the initiation of motion. If you place a block on a table and try to very lightly push it into motion, it will first resist that motion because of the frictional force operating in the direction opposite the applied force of your push. You can push harder and it will still remain still. So this is uh, 
the kinetic friction, you don't, you don't have to uh, focus too much on the static friction. Like if this is a car tire, all it takes is a little push in the wrong direction and that car can slide off the road. That's the applied force. Hopefully your friction force is, is, um, is higher than the applied force so that the, the tire stays on the road. The frictional force will always precisely oppose the applied force. Static friction will increase until the magnitude of the applied force exceeds the maximum static frictional force the table can exert. Then the force of the push can no longer be canceled out and the block will begin to accelerate. This frictional force is proportional to the normal force. So the heavier the object, the greater the normal force and the greater the frictional force. This is because as the weight of the object increases, the harder it presses down on the surface, which will increase the number of contact points between the object and the surface. The static frictional... So you can think of uh, football players, right? Bigger football players, bigger feet, harder to make them slide off their feet because of all that weight is uh, increasing the frictional force. Be anywhere from zero to the maximum possible value, depending on the forces operating on the object. Since the static frictional force will be equal to the applied force until the maximum is reached. The magnitude of this maximum can be calculated this way. F max is equal to the coefficient of static friction times the magnitude of the normal force. We're going to use a triangle, okay? I know this could be intimidating. This coefficient, represented by the Greek letter mu, is unitless and unique to the surface in question. And we have tabulated these coefficients for a variety of common surfaces, like glass, steel, wood, and rubber. So this is easy to remember because the bigger the number, the more friction there is. The smaller the number, the more slippery, the more uh, less friction, less friction there is. Various combinations thereof. As we said, once the applied force exceeds the maximum static friction, the object will begin to move. Bear in mind that this equation involves scalar quantities, not vectors, and therefore implies nothing about direction. As we said, static friction opposes the initiation of motion, but once an object is in motion, it is now moving against kinetic friction. This is the force that opposes relative sliding motion. Kinetic friction is always lesser than static friction, which you will notice if you try to push any object across the surface, like a heavy box across the floor. It will be more difficult to get the box going than it is to keep it moving once you've started. There are coefficients of kinetic friction as well, and these will be different from the coefficients of static friction for the same material. Yeah, don't, don't stress about kinetic friction. Static friction, that's what's on your test. These values allow us to calculate the magnitude of the kinetic frictional force acting on a sliding object. Friction isn't always a nuisance. It can also be used to our advantage. When we walk, the static friction between our feet and the ground allows us to propel ourselves forward. Especially in sports. Then our feet simply sliding back. Car tires take advantage of friction to move the car forward, sure. and they are designed with grooves to divert water away so that it does not interfere with the contact between the tire and the ground. This allows it to maintain traction rather than skidding. We should note that air resistance is another type of fluid friction. When a car or a plane moves through the atmosphere, the particles in the air hinder its motion, offering some kinetic friction. This is true of motion through any fluid in a way that depends on the viscosity of the fluid, which represents the fluid's resistance to flow. So by now we are familiar with a few of the vectors we will commonly use in physics. An object that rests on a flat surface on Earth will experience a downward force due to its weight, as well as an upward normal force that is equal in magnitude. If some horizontal force is applied, there will also be an opposing frictional force. If the applied force is less than the maximum static frictional force of that surface, the horizontal vectors will cancel each other out, just like the vertical ones, and the object will remain at rest. If the applied force exceeds the maximum friction, the object will accelerate in the direction of the push, and the kinetic frictional force will oppose its forward motion. That's like a car sliding off the road. So we can expect to see these four vectors in lots of the free body diagrams from this point forward. A common example. Okay, we're going to stop there. Uh, we're going to learn about ramps at another time. But for now, we're going to focus on when a car turns a corner and is it going to stay on the road. So uh, go to 03 centripetal force.
The problem says a thousand kilogram car rounds a curve on a flat road of a radius of 50 meters at a speed of 50 kilometers per hour. Uh, I need to apologize that, you know, I used 50 twice. So you might get a little mis misled that, oh, the 50 meters is going to be used somewhere, 50 kilometers somewhere else. But I'll try to be as clear as possible. And your practice problems will not have the same number twice. Will the car make the turn or will it skid? The pavement is dry and the coefficient static, the coefficient of static friction is 0.6 or when the pavement is icy and the coefficient of static friction is 0.25. Remember the higher the number, more friction there is. Better for car tires, right? So let's draw a picture of our car and its path. Just draw yourself a circle, draw yourself a rectangle. That'll be your car. And then show the car moving in a direction with 50 kilometers per hour as its speed. This is especially important if you ever drive in the mountains. If you're going to the mountains and you see those sharp turns around the edges of the mountain, engineers have to know how fast can cars go safely without going off the road when they turn, especially if they have like cheap tires. You want to assume uh, the worst case scenarios or when it's raining. Okay, that's when the roads are really slow. So you got a, uh, you have something called a vector, which is uh, actually a scalar. This is this is the way the car is moving. This is how fast the car is moving. This is how far the car away is from the middle of the of the uh, turn. And then we have force, force little c. That's centripetal force. That's the force required to pull an object back towards the center without colliding with the center. You're just, you're just guiding it back. Kind of like when you grab a friend and you spin around, right? You don't want, you, you don't want to crash into your friend, but you're pulling your friend so that they don't um, get released into the air or into like a building or something like that. All right, so the car's turning. We need to first find how much force is required to keep the car on the road. And then we'll see if the friction is enough to uh, keep the tires on the road. So you not only have to draw a car, you have to draw a tire. And here's your tire. The tire has four forces acting on it. You learned about weight. That's what pulls things to earth. We learned about normal force, which is uh, opposite of weight, keeping objects from being crushed, right? We're not just puddles of, of skin and bone on the ground. We actually have a force going opposite of weight. But on tires, there's also the force of the car moving versus the force of friction that slows cars down, which we want, especially if you're turning. So you have F sub N, F sub G, F sub A, that's just applied force, and then F sub F, your friction. With this big picture in mind, you should be able to, to follow along with these calculations to predict, will the car stay on the road or will it slip off the road? Okay. And I made a note, frictional force or big F, little f, that just means how much stopping power the tire has. Can the tire have enough friction to stop the skid or even prevent the skid from beginning? All right, first step. Find the centripetal force. What's the minimum force required to keep the car on the road before we even talk about friction? So we're going to use that triangle from our warm-up. F, uh, F sub C equals mass times velocity squared divided by radius. Why radius? Because the car is actually moving in a circular motion whenever a car turns. Now, in order to find F sub C, we need to find V, because V is um, in, a, in a unit we can't use, right? Kilometers per hour is not meters per second. So find V. We're given mass, we're given radius, and we're given velocity. We will use mass later. We will use radius 
now. Yes. It's M V squared. M V squared. Now we're gonna do a fraction that converts length and time at the, at the same, uh, simultaneously. In order to turn 50 kilometers per hour into meters per second, we need to convert the kilometers into meters and then convert the hours into seconds. So we're gonna multiply this by two fractions, question. One hour, because because the problem says kilometers per hour. Now, when you carry everything over, it becomes fifty times a thousand divided by thirty six hundred. We have a student do this for us. Rafael, grab a calculator. Put in fifty times a thousand. Hit enter and then divide by 3600. And then other exponents at the very right. Did you get times 10 to the one? No? Okay. Um, I need to check your calculator because. The previous physics problem. So 50 times 1,000 equals, and then click divide by 36, uh, 3,600. Yeah, what'd you get? So you did 50 times 1,000. You should get 50,000. And you divide it by 3,600. Times 10 to the 1. All right? And if we round, it's 1.39 E. E means the same thing as time 10, time 10 uh, to the one. And this is meters per second. So now we found velocity. We can now plug it into our force equation in step one and solve for the minimum amount of force we need to keep the car on the road. We're even not, we're not including friction. So the equation is F sub C equals M squared. Oh, that my, my, my B didn't carry over. Let me um, write that down. M times V squared over R. So if we plug it in, it's going to be 1,000 times 1.39 E to the 1 squared divided by 50. Let's have uh, Crystal do this one. Crystal, grab a calculator. Put in 1,000 times 1.39 Second, x minus one, one squared divided by 50. You can do it all in one step. One thousand, that's 1.39. Second, x minus one, one squared divided by 50, all in one step. What do you get? You get an answer? Like some help? 
1,000 times 1.39 second x minus 1, 1 squared divided by 50. Stars or figures, figures out the numbers. Yeah. She got three thousand eight eight hundred sixty four. Uh, everyone else in the class, you can use three point eight six times ten to the third power. Uh, Crystal, will you move your bag so I can see what you do on your table? Now we're gonna use this to compare our calculation of friction force. Is it enough force in our tires to keep the car on the road? All it has to do is reach 3.86 times 10 to the third power or more. If it's less, the car will slide off. Question is N. N is Newtons, that's the units of force. So you don't have to put n, but you'll you might see n in your um in your future future education. All right. So calculate force for the drive pavement for the drive pavement. We're going to use this triangle. Frictional force is at the top. At the bottom is the static friction coefficient. That's what, uh, I think it's Dr. Dave from YouTube. He's talking about this number. Higher the number, more friction. The smaller the number, the more uh, less friction there is. I keep saying more or less friction. The less friction there is. And then force of normal, we already know that, right? So let's just plug it in. If we want to find force of friction, you're going to end up multiplying the static friction uh, coefficient times normal force. You plug in. Point 0.60 is the frictional coefficient for a road that's dry. We're going to multiply that to a negative mass times <laughs> negative acceleration, which is gravity. That's our F sub N. And then we get an answer. Uh, let me have someone who's here. Yale, grab a calculator. And you're going to put in 0. 0.6 times negative 1,000 times negative 9.8. Question. This? Yeah. So in the YouTube video, he called this fancy M. He called it mu. Mu. Uh, it's important to, to make sure this M is not the same as your mass. So draw an M, but then make one leg much longer than the other. I don't know why the symbols aren't easier than this, because they didn't have keyboards back then when they invented it. So mu is our M, S, which is the coefficient for friction. So you multiply this across. Uh, what'd you get, Yale, when you did it? Will this car stay on the road, Yale? What do you think? The minimum force for the car to stay on the road is 3.86. We need that car to stay pulling towards the middle. Yeah. Our tires give us 5.88, which is keeping the car on the road, All right? So yes, it will make the turn. You just did what civil engineers do, everybody. You should get paid for this. Fifth step, the icy pavement. 
is 0.25 enough friction to keep the car on the road. So you're going to calculate F sub F again, but this time with the uh, static coefficient of 0.25. So you're pretty, pretty much repeating it, but you're going to put 0.25 in there. Student who will calculate this is Kayla. I know you just came back from the restroom, but uh, if you could just do a little calculation for us, I'd appreciate it. Put in uh, 0.25 times negative 1,000 times negative 9.8. I think you uh, didn't include an extra negative. So it's negative 1,000 and negative 9.8 would give you a positive number. But your your value was correct. Yeah, uh, the, the, the input is 0.25 times negative 1,000 times negative 9.8. E3, E3. And um, that number is lower than 3.86, the minimum amount of force that we need to keep the car on the road. So the car will not be the turn. And roads like that should not be constructed. All right, class. That is today's lesson. It's time to give you your practice problems. Stop the